Let's start on the housing subject, if we could, Carl, because uh, our last guest was talking about that as an area of concern mm -hmm. to him, that he saw uh, the usual measures of wages against the price of housing. He, he thought were up at, uh, at levels that were worrying. But you're, you're not so concerned just yet. No, I mean, even on average nationally, they're some way off the levels they hit in the, the last cycle. So they've come down a lot since the uh, global financial crisis. And that national number is sort of distorted upwards by London and particular parts of central London. When you go out into the UK regions, the picture is rather different. And the regions are a very long way from a bubble and indeed are still in the process of their housing markets trying to bottom out and start to recover. Yeah, I mean, the boss of Cress Nicholson, who uh, Caroline was talking to at the end of last week, was saying that the media becomes fixated on London and isn't yes. it, uh, taking it uh, into this is account. where most of us live, uh, to comment on these things. Well, it is. Um, but the Financial Stability Committee at the Bank of England, of course, has a new remit in this particular cycle that we're in, and that is to keep an eye on the housing market. You're not expecting them to actually have to step in just yet then and do anything. They won't. They won't yet, but they may, may eventually. Um, what you tend to see, frankly, with bubbles in each cycle is that they pop up somewhere slightly different, that you do get bubbles, they repeat themselves due to strong credit growth and uh, then a, a nice story to fuel the bubble and it's likely that the bubble could well be somewhere else that their, their eye isn't. Usually the bubble isn't where you, you expect it to be, it's somewhere you're not monitoring, yeah. particularly not the same place as in the last cycle. Usually quite good for uh, legislating for the last crisis. I yeah. think that's the Carl, let's talk right. about the economy itself because you know, you've know you raised your forecast for both this year and next year. You talk long and hard about how the consumer has helped Give, give this economy a, a real boost, but uh, we, we, need, we need something else, don't we? We need help from exports, we need help from investment, and the second quarter data didn't show much on those two points, no, it did didn't. it? And so for the recovery to continue to gain momentum, it go, gained good momentum in Q2, and then it's probably gained a little bit more momentum in Q3, but for that process to continue on into next year, we need the recovery to broaden out beyond the consumer to business investment and to exports. There's encouraging signs in the surveys, but we need those surveys to turn into reality of hard data. That's why we though. sent Boris Johnson to China, is not it, in yeah. part? <laughs> I mean, they're about FDI, isn't he? But yes. uh, I'm sure they're talking trade as well. Uh, you mentioned the UK economy moving into higher orbits. In, 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 uh, this is to pick up on one of the uh, intergalactic themes that uh, From Mark, Carney, Mark Carney has yeah. introduced into the UK. Yeah. So is higher orbit escape velocity, or is that something different? So I think that in this case that is a escape velocity. So if, if our forecasts are correct and you move from 1.4% growth this year to 2.4% next year and a little stronger uh, in 2015, then you would be quite clearly in escape velocity and you'd have pulled back above the UK's trend rate of growth. What are the big risks? Carl, because actually your risks, say, you say, are to the upside. You might have to raise your forecast. So certainly some risk. of the, the, sh the short-term data suggests that our near-term forecasts might be uh, on the low side and equally likely to get revised up as down, whereas over the last 18 months we would have said the, the opposite, that the risks were to the downside. Now there's risks there to the upside as well. Very immediately, though, we have to get through the process of the U.S. raising the, the debt ceiling. And if they were not to do that, not only would it be cataclysmic for their own economy, it would uh, quite clearly knock the U.K. economy out of orbit and actually knock it back into recession if they didn't raise the debt ceiling and they kept it unraised for a long period of time. In reality, even if they didn't raise it, they'd probably raise it quite quickly once they saw the impacts on their economy and also on their stock market. So you can knock the economy out of orbit, even if we found escape velocity. We're now yeah. starting to test yeah. My, uh, yeah. the, the extent my of my interplanetary yeah, exactly. uh, relationships. Yeah. Just one more thing as I was reading your report this morning, Carl. I was thinking, the fortunes of the economy have changed so much, haven't they? Six months ago, we were talking about triple recession. How? How did it just suddenly change like that? Because it did, didn't it? Well, I think some of it's, it's, it's that... The, the tower risks that were frightening people, be it businesses or investors, have, 
have dissipated and you first saw that effect in financial markets and then second you usually see it in business investments and that's now come through and then you usually see actually the real data start to move so some of the big concerns that were holding people back uh, things like the eurozone crisis have gone through their sort of critical phase and so Households, businesses are less paralysed than they were. So households have been, house, consumer confidence pick up, picked up a great deal, and households have been confident enough to make big ticket purchases, things like cars. Mm. We now see, need businesses confident enough to make big ticket investments as well. Carl, thanks for joining us today. Great stuff. Carla Story there joining us from the Ernst Young Item Club. He's senior economic advisor.